Greetings, Bethlehem family and friends. Whether you're joining us in person or connecting virtually, we warmly welcome you to our worship service. We appreciate your choice in making us your place of worship this morning. Your presence excites us, and we invite you to maintain a connection with us. A special welcome is extended to our first-time guest. If you are attending in person for the first time, you'll find visitor cards on your row. Feel free to scan the QR code at the bottom of the visitor's card and stay connected with us. Big C Events and Entertainment proudly presents the Come As You Are Gospel Concert, honoring Mr. Alan Brown and the Legends Award. Saturday, April the 20th, coming to the Faith, Hope, and Charity Deliverance Temple, 7330 Monticello Road, Columbia. The doors will open at 3, concert starts at 4, featuring the rising stars of East Dover, the Gospel General, Women of Strength, Devontae and the New Voices of Zion, Shawan and Motivation, and LB and True Divine. Devotion by Reverend Clarence Gunter, Loretta Coleman, your MC. Advance tickets fifty dollars in advance, twenty dollars a day at the concert. Cash app dollar sign Big Corley three three. Raffle tickets one dollar. First prize one hundred. Second prize thirty five. And third prize twenty five. Big C's barbecue will be sold. That's the big come at you all gospel concert honoring Mr. Alan Brown with the Legends Award. Saturday, April the twentieth, coming to the Faith, Hope, and Charity Deliverance Temple, seventy three thirty Monticello Road, Columbia. Presented by Big C's Event and Entertainment. Don't miss it. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. If you're interested in joining or being a part of the Mass or Youth Choirs, your presence is requested. We kindly ask that you join us in the sanctuary for rehearsals on the following dates. Mass Choir, Thursday, April 25th at 6.30 p.m. And Youth Choir, Saturday, April 20th at 10 o'clock a.m. The third nine weeks honor roll recognition will be held on Sunday, April 21st during worship service. Please place all report cards in the box labeled report cards in the vestibule and in the black box located in the breezeway or they may be scanned into Ms. Boykwin no later than Wednesday, April 17th. Attention middle and high school students. Are you getting worried about upcoming finals? Does a new relationship have you stressed? Do you always feel anxiety? You are not alone. Grab a friend and come to Friday Night Live on April 19th at 6 o'clock p.m. for an interactive discussion on stress management. Savonia Gilliard, a professional school counselor for the Kershaw County School District, will share ways to help you deal with stress and anxiety. There will be activities to get you moving and interact with your peers along with refreshments. We hope to see you there. It's scholarship time. Are you or do you know a graduating high school senior that plans to attend an accredited school for higher learning in the fall of 2024? If so, please see trustee Michael Gladman Jr. for a scholarship opportunity. The Brotherhood Ministry and the Men's Day Committee of 2024 are hosting Family Fun Game Night on Saturday, April 27th from 6 o'clock p.m. to 9 o'clock p.m. in the Wiley Kennedy Family Life Center. There will be fun, food, fellowship, and games. We hope to see each of you there. The VBS ministry is in need of teachers for VBS 2024 for the nursery, kindergarten through 12th grade, college, and hard of hearing. If you are interested in teaching or assisting in the classroom, kindly reach out to Ryan Simmons via email or text at rtssimmons at gmail.com or 803-608-5757 with the grade level assignment that you prefer. Now, let us direct all glory and honor to our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, as we transition into worship. Good morning, class. And good morning to all of those who are watching by way of live stream. We're just excited to have you with us again this morning. We have a power pack lesson 
uh, to look at this morning. And uh, we pray that the Holy Spirit would just have his way so all that we said and do here this morning would be pleasing in his sight. Uh, our lesson this morning is April the 14th, uh, lesson number seven, talks about the faith of a centurion. Lesson will be coming from Luke chapter number seven, verses one through 10. So if you do not have a book, we're coming out of the book of Luke uh, once again this morning, chapter number seven, verses one through 10. And our lesson focus this morning is, is that we should have faith to call out to Jesus. Our church home theme for the entire quarter is revive us again, O oh Lord. We're going to discuss Jesus' response to our calls for help. Also, we're going to study how Jesus responded to this, the centurion's request. <clears throat> and last but not least, we're going to continuously call out to Jesus. <clears throat> and we know that in our prayers, each and every day, we are calling out to the Lord. Uh, first, we say thank you for what he's already done. You know, and then, then uh, we may petition the Lord for someone else. Our prayers should never be about ourselves. That's a selfish prayer. Now, there is some time that you will call on the Lord for some help, but it should not be 90% of your prayer. The Lord said, I already know what you need before you even ask me. So we don't have to spend all our time praying for ourselves. There's a lot of folks out that need help, and we don't have to go far to find them. So our prayer should mostly be for someone else. And we're going to find that in our lesson this morning. As we saw in last week's lesson, it's going to be a continuation. I'm going to kind of combine the two lessons uh, this morning as we look at what's going on in our lesson today. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to get right into our lesson. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, we come by before your mighty throne of grace. Once again on this morning, we say thank you for this beautiful, cool, crisp, but sunny Sunday morning. Oh, Lord, we thank you for how you watched over us on last night, and you didn't let anything happen to us while we were sleeping. You let us get a good night's rest. Then you woke us up early this morning to see this brand new day that you made for us. Realizing you, you, you didn't have to do it, but you did, we're just going to say thank you, Lord, and we're going to come and praise your name this morning. We're going to praise you because you're worthy to be praised. Nobody else but you could do what you have already done for us. And, oh, God, we know that our future is bright because Jesus told us in his word that he's going back to prepare a place for us. And he will come again and receive us to, to our himself. So this morning, as we, we, we are still down here on your word, oh, God, we want to just study this word this morning so we can have a closer relationship with you. So that when you do come, you find out that we have completed our task, our race has been run, and we finished our course, and we're ready to go back home with you. Now come, Lord Jesus, and bless us this morning as only you can in the precious and sweet name of Jesus the Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, compassion. Jesus traveled to Capernaum, it says, and on entering the city of a, a group of elders of the Jews made a request on behalf of one of the captains of the Roman army. And we're going to look at uh, verses, the, the centurion's request, uh, Luke chapter number 7 verses 1 through 5, and they read like this. It says when, And I'm coming from the NIV. It says, When Jesus had finished saying all of this to the people who were listening, to him, listening, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion's servant, who, who uh, his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him. This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. In verse number one, it says, Jesus had finished saying this to all the people who were listening. He entered Capernaum. Now, Jesus had just been out. Uh, and we, when we look back at chapter number six, we find out he was teaching the Beatitudes. And he had been out there with the people teaching the Beatitudes, pretty much the entire entire chapter of number six and then he came on back over into Capernaum and so when he got uh, there there was a centurion servant who his master valued very highly and was sick and about to die now this this man had served his master well and he was about to to die and the centurion wanted to make a move so he said the centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to 
to, to him, asking him to come and heal this servant. Now let's look at the centurion and, and who he really is in our lesson this morning. So we, can, we kind of bring you in line of what, who this man is. This says in the province of the empire, including Judea, the Roman army organized in, is organized into a legion. And sometimes there's more than one legion. And a legion consists of about 5,000 soldiers. Each legion is broken down into 10 cohorts. And the cohorts are then divided once again into what is called centuries. And the, and the, and the cohort has about anywhere from 480 to 500 men. So you see they're breaking them, breaking them down in ranks. And then uh, it, it's broken on down to about 80 to 100 men. And that's where you get a century because a century is 100, right? Okay, so the man is over the century is up called the centurion. Now it tells us that um, when um, you get about the age of 17 in the Roman Empire, every male, every male, if there's nothing wrong with him, he's going to enter service. He's going to serve his country. And unlike America, where you may sign up for two years or three years or four years and get out, he's obligated for 20 years. Oh, yeah, he's going to serve his country. And should he survive those 20 years, it says once he retires, he's treated very handsomely. Now, the word centurion is not a play toy word. This is a very skilled soldier, very experienced soldier. Uh, and he has moved up the ranks. It's kind of like when you enter the, the military here, you enter it as a private and you continue to move up the ranks as you qualify. This man is very qualified, and not only does is he, he qualified to be the centurion, but it tells us that he, his pay level rises as well. He's, a, he's paid about five times more than the average GI is being paid. And it tells us once again that if he's well liked by his superiors, he has the opportunity to roam all over the Roman Empire. So he doesn't have to just stay in one place. Then, in other words, if he's brought to Fort Jackson, he don't have to stay on the base. He can come and go as he please because he's a well-trusted, well-educated man in the, in the ranks of a centurion. Now, the centurion is also the highest rank that an enlisted man can get. You can't go any higher than a centurion, but he's okay right here. It says most of the men that reach the ranks of centurion they never retire. They stay in the military for the rest of their lives. And it says uh, the centurion has to also be a man that's, that's battlefield worthy, and he must be a man who can think on his feet. So in the heat of a battle, he got to be ready to make decisions, is all what they're saying. He got to be ready to make a decision. So we find out the centurion is a, is a man who has authority. First of all, he rules over a, 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 a section of people that's in the military, and he didn't get it by just being somebody's cousin or somebody's buddy. He, he, he had to move up the ranks as he was qualified to be this. Now, when we look at him this morning, we find out that he has, has a servant who has gotten sick. And, and, and as I was thinking about this, y'all have to bear with me. You might want to laugh at me, that, but that'll be all right. Uh, I saw this servant and, and this centurion as, 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 as Batman. Y'all know that comic book character called Batman? Batman had a servant uh, called Alfred. Now, Alfred had a double role. Because, see, see, he had to serve the master, Bruce Wayne, who was a multimillionaire. Then he had to flip the script and serve Batman, who was Bruce Wayne in, in, in incognito. But they were buddies. They were friends. And, and, and you find out as, as we read the, the various comic books down through the years that every time Batman got in, a tr in, a, in, a, in, a, in trouble or got hurt or whatever, Alfred would come to his rescue. So they, they were not just only master and servant, but they were friends. And I saw this in Centurion the same way when uh, uh, he went out to find help for his, his servant. See, if he was just another servant, you know, as, as a master, he'd just kick him to the side and get another one. And I'm saying that in the sense of because the word servant means slave. And you know, and back in the days when, when there were slaves, <coughs> if you got sick, he'd just go ahead and get a Biden and go to the market and buy another one and replace us. But he didn't do this to this man. He was very, very close to this man. So he said the centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. Now, you notice he didn't just get in on anybody. He got the leaders. He got the elders of the church. We can break that down to today when, when, when there's a serious need. Uh, as, as, as we have here at Bethlehem, we have a watch system, and everybody that comes here has a deacon that you come under. 
Now, just on ordinary things, you might call your deacon, have a conversation with him, and just need a word of prayer, what I, we, we call your deacon, we come see about you. But if you get to be a serious business, we go a little higher. The pastor, we got somebody over here. You need to go see him. He's not going to go by himself. He's going to get the chairman to go with him. But see, you got the, the, that's the hierarchy of it. So you see right here, the centurion just didn't call on any, any, any member of the congregation. He didn't call on any deacon. He called a top, top person. He said, now, he called the elders of the church. Now, it got down to the point where here where you see they were there, that he was also friends with the elders. So look at what it says here, uh, asking them to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him. Why would they plead with Jesus? For, for, for a centurion. After all, these, these, the centurion was over them. And normally the, the Roman army treated the Jewish, Jewish nation harshly. But they were friends. This man was coming around. He had not arrived yet, but he's coming around, he's coming around the corner. Like, like us, you know, you're out there in the world and you're doing what you want and, and oftentimes as bad as you think you can be. Uh, but you keep coming to church. You keep coming to church. And that word is hitting you, and that word is hitting you. And after a while, you begin to make that turn around the corner. And you, and, and you finally accept the Lord Jesus. And when you accept Jesus Christ, your you, you first thing you get is uh, salvation. Then you move on into sanctification. And then you move on into service. And see, he's, he's not quite there yet, but he's turning the corner. After all, he's in the Roman army, and they don't believe in, in God. They don't, the God that we serve, they don't believe in this man called Jesus. But he's been hanging around with these elders for a while, and it's beginning to get to him. Just like us, we've been hanging around the church for a long time, and, that, and we can continue to hear the word, and finally it begins to get to us, and we start making a change. All right, he said he pleaded earnestly with them. So he didn't just ask them. You know, it's the difference between asking somebody to do something and really getting down to the near, real nitty-gritty. So if you want to put it in our term, he was begging. That's what he was doing. Would y'all please? My buddy is sick, and I need, him, I need him to get some help. And he's about to die. Now, that tells you right there how Jesus come into the picture. Because, see, by him dying on the cross and going to the grave. And just two weeks ago, we celebrated his getting up. See, the grave couldn't hold him. Death couldn't do nothing with him either. He defeated both of them. Oh, they thought they had him. But he said, oh, death, where is your stain? And oh, grave, where is your victory? You can't handle me. So in his getting up, he allowed us to also get up in him. And this centurion is coming now. And he needs this man. He said, I heard about Jesus. Kind of sounds like Job, doesn't it? Job said, I heard about you. But now I know you for myself. Oh, Lord, hit him with them 72 questions. He said, wow. Before he could ask someone, the Lord, hit him, with, hit him with another one. Where were you, Job? Couldn't say nothing. So he said, now I know you for myself. Now, this, this man, he don't, know, he don't really know Jesus for himself, but he's already, with all of the clout he had, do you not see in this word where he said, go get him? He could have sent a regiment of soldiers to get Jesus. And he, go get him. Bring him to me. But he didn't come in his authority. He come in his meekness. And that's why I want to show you how, how high a rank this guy had. But he didn't come with no authority. He come in his meekness. Just like we may get a job and we start on a lower level. And as we begin to, begin to serve the company, they move us up in rank all the way up to the point that we might be the supervisor of the whole plant. Now, we might be the boss of a whole lot of people, but we don't push Jesus around. When we need something from Jesus, we got to get down. No, as I actually said today, you can't get up in Jesus' face. You just don't approach Jesus like that. You got to come with humility, because see, Jesus don't have to do nothing for us, but he did it all for us, because we couldn't do nothing for ourselves. And he said, well, now, would y'all please, uh, Asking him to go, to, to go and earnestly with him, he said, this man, and when they went to Jesus, when they came to Jesus, he said, they pleaded earnestly with him, this man deserves to have you do this. Do any of us deserve anything from Jesus? But that's how much they care for this man. And it's what he said about what this man has done. He said, because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So he took his own wealth out of his own pocket and helped them build their synagogue. 
And in looking at the history of this, it says that any time there's at least eight family of Jews in any location, they can build a synagogue. Got to have at least eight or more to build a synagogue. Now, the synagogue is not the big church, the one that's up there up in Jerusalem where they go and offer their sacrifices. It's just a small church over here on the corner, as Bethlehem might be, or right over the corner in Greenview First Baptist, down the street, St. Paul. But it's not the big hierarchy. It's just a small place where the neighborhoods come and they fellowship. But he's, they said he helped us to build our synagogue. Now, this does not sound like a man who want to push people around because he has authority. He's been hanging around these guys, and he's fallen in love with them, and he's beginning to believe in their God because he's, believe, he's heard about what Jesus has been doing. Now, just last week, we talked about Jesus and the uh, paralyzed. And I want to put a, a, a pause right there because I said some things last week that's not really correct, and I want to straighten it up. I told you last week that as I was studying that uh, uh, Peter, James, and John were his first three disciples, but that's not correct. I didn't do enough studying. And see, when you don't do enough studying, you can make mistakes. But when you look back at it, you find out that Andrew was walking with John the Baptist. Now, that's Peter's brother. And, and, and Andrew uh, left John and followed Jesus. And it was Andrew who went and got Peter. And as they walked on down the shoreline, then they called James and John. So you see, Andrew was, was in that crowd. Matter of fact, he was the first one. And then he got in that crowd. So there was four of them, Andrew and his brother Peter, then James and John. And then there was another, another place where I didn't quite do enough research, but the Holy Spirit is going to mess with you when you don't do what's right now. So, so I had to get with this because Sunday afternoon he was kind of picking at me like, you know, how like a bird might be picking on, on the side of, a, of the house, annoying you. He was annoying me. So I had to go and look at this. And he showed it to me right fast over in the book of Mark, chapter number 2. It tells us there were some men. Now, I told you last week we didn't know how many men it was. But the script says this. So I was kind of halfway in and halfway out. Kind of like the preacher said yesterday, I'm going to sing a half of two songs. <laughs> I was kind of half of two songs right. It wasn't all the way there. But it says like this. Some men came, carrying, uh, came to Jesus with a paralytic man, and four of them were carrying him. Now, now I, I want to relate this to you so you can understand what I'm saying. Well, one, one time we had a co-worker to pass away and he was a military guy and the uh, uh the military had the men that who's gonna carry his casket to the grave with military but they had not got there yet so the six of us railroad guys we said well we'll carry him so we we carried him out of the church and and about halfway to the grave site the military guys showed up so we made us we stopped made a transition right there uh we backed off the casket handing it to them so now you got 12 guys 12 men, and six of them were carrying him. Y'all get it now? Well, we still don't know how many men it was, but we know four of them carried him. All right, we'll straighten that up. Never intend to give you bad information. Always going to make sure we give you the proper information on what we're teaching in Sunday school on Sunday morning. So these men said to him, he deserved to have you to do this. They really like this guy. He don't really deserve it. Just like we really don't deserve anything from God. We, don't, we didn't really deserve Jesus, but he gave us to him, gave us, him to us anyhow. Thank God he did. He said, but because he loves our nation and he has built our synagogue, they are telling Jesus what this man has done, trying to qualify him to serve him. But we don't qualify, do we? God just do it anyhow. All right. Let's look at our self section, uh, second section here, and, and, and we're going to delve into it a little bit deeper. He said, it's centurion's humble, humility, verses uh, 6 through 10, Luke chapter number 7, verse 6 through 10, and it, re 10, and it read like this. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one go, and he goes, and that one come, and he comes. I said to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. 
Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Verse number six says, so Jesus went with them. You don't have to persuade Jesus too hard to help us. We know he went to the cross for us. We didn't even have to ask him to do that, but he did. That was the job he was sent to do. Jesus came to earth to serve, not to be served. He said, I came not for the sick, for the righteous. Get it right. He said, I didn't come for the righteous, but for the sick. He said, I didn't come to condemn, but to save. Jesus wasn't going to condemn this officer's request. Now, I want you to look at what I was saying earlier in our prayer, in my prayer this morning is, the officer didn't need anything for himself. All of this was on the behalf of his friend. Have you ever went to God in prayer for someone, your friend, maybe your neighbor, your coworker, could be somebody you don't even know. You just see a need and you call on the one you know can fix the need. So he says, so Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, now, I want to pin that right there. How many times have you prayed in hope? Think about it. That's about most time, isn't it? Because your prayer is not guaranteed to be answered, is it? Sometimes it answers, he answers it right away. Sometimes it might be months. Might be even years. So long that you forgot you prayed that prayer. But see, our time is not God's time. And then some prayers that God has to hold, hold up on it because he's going to answer it, but we're not ready to receive the reward of the prayer yet. So he can't give it to us. Sometimes we pray for stuff, and if God give it to us right now, it would hurt us so bad, they would knock us back instead of pulling us forward. See, that's the kind of God we serve. He knows us better than we know ourselves. Now, there are some prayers we pray, and, and, and he answers the prayer, but he don't answer the way we want it to be prayed answered. So we say he didn't answer my prayer, but yes, he did. You just didn't get what you wanted. All right, God knows what you need and what you don't need. And every now and then he said, I'll give you the desires of your heart. Not all the time. He said, every now and then I'll give you what you want. Okay, he, so what I'm saying here is the centurion, his faith had grown to the point that he said he was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him. So he, in his mind, said, you have to see the centurion said, I called Jesus to come and he's on his way. Why would he send men to stop Jesus from coming if he didn't think Jesus was coming? Now, I didn't say he saw Jesus coming. They said he was far from the house. So something clicked. See, when I thought, thought it earlier, I said he was coming around the curve. See, he's in the home stretch now because he know, he, 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 he don't, he's not going on what he heard anymore. He's actually believing who Jesus is. And that's what we have to get in our lives. We hear about Jesus and we hear about Jesus. Then eventually we say, Lord, come into my life. And when he does, we get to know him for ourselves. Then we know the power, begin to learn about the power of Jesus. And many of us still don't know about the power, how powerful Jesus really is. And I'm gonna put it like this, as long as we're in this body, we will probably never understand the power of Jesus. Because there's a lot of power there to be learned about. Now, when we go back to our scripture and, and look at so when Jesus left, he said, I won't leave you comfortless. I will send you a comforter called the Holy Spirit. And he will come and he will rest, rule, and abide within you. And he said that now the things and the miracles that I perform, you will be able to do even greater than that. What is he saying? There's more of you than it is of me. So you'll be able to do miracles just like I did. But do you see miracles happening much today? We forgot we have the power. Now, I touched on this last week, and I, I got to reiterate it again. He said, when you, when you pray, believe in what you say, when you pray, and you shall have it. Now, that means honest, sincere prayer. That's why he said the effectual, fervent prayer, y'all got it, of the righteous, availeth much. Do you count yourself righteous? Why aren't your prayer working? You got too much hope and not enough belief. It will work if you pray right. When I was growing up, this lady used to sing a song, and as a kid, she don't understand it, but as you get older, you learn, you, you, you learn to understand what the song was saying. She said, if you pray right, 
He will never say no. But just, But you got to pray right. And he won't say no. He'll do what you ask. So Centurion was praying, but see, we didn't see the prayer in here. So he called on some friends to come help him get Jesus to him. That's a prayer, isn't it? Think about it for a moment. And in his prayer, he realized, I got more faith than this. Then he tells, he sends someone else out. He says, stop him. He don't have to come all the way to my house. First, he said, Lord, don't, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. Are we really deserving of Jesus? None of us deserve Jesus. The trip's already told. All of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory, so that we don't deserve anything from Jesus. That's why we have to thank him so much for what he's already done for us. He said, I don't deserve for you to come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. Now, before, before Jesus went to the cross, we couldn't come to Jesus. We had a priest we had to go to. See, it was secondhand. But we don't have to go to the priest anymore. Because see, they said that day that he died, when he hung his head and died, the veil in the temple was torn in half. It was once concealed, now it's being revealed. We can pray to God anywhere, anytime. We don't have to have nobody to pray for us. Now, there are some times we can't get a prayer through because we, are so, so we, are so, we were so worried about stuff. It's, it consumes us to the point we really do need somebody else to pray a prayer for us. And thank God we have prayer warriors. Thank God you have friends that know the word of prayer. That when you call on them, you say, I need you to pray for me. You know you call the right person, that they can go and pray for you. See, this is what the centurion was saying when he went to these elders, I need you to pray for me. I need you to bring Jesus to the house. And see, so that's what you're doing when you call your friends. I need you to pray for you. I need Jesus to come to my house. Can't you see it? It's right there. I pray you see it. See, Lord, don't trouble yourself. I'm not worthy. And we're not worthy, but he coming anyhow. But he says that this is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. I was not in the right relationship to come to you. But, but since the curtain in the temple has been torn in half, we have a right now. God has given us the right to come to him. As ranked sinners, he said, come on in the house. He said, if you come, I will in no ways cast you out. I will receive you unto myself. So just come. He said, but say the word and my servant will be healed. Now, you see, he's got some faith now. His faith that went from way down here is moving on up. He said, now, this is why I believe what you do will work. He said, for I myself am under, I mean, man under authority. That's why I say he was in centurion. He had, he was over 100 people. Now, the people that was in the cohort was above him as the rank goes up. And then the people, that the one that was running the whole legion was above the cohort. So that, you know, I don't know how the ranks of the military goes because I've never been in there, so I'm not going to stand up here and make a fool of myself. But I do know that a five-star general is over a one-star general. I know that much. <laughs> and all of them over the private. And I understand a private can lose his stripe. They want to call him a book private. So he's on the bottom of the rank. So there's a, there is some, some authority in the military. So we find out this guy says, for I myself, a man under authority, first of all, people can tell me what to do. Then he said, but at the same time, uh, uh, with soldiers under, he said, I am a man under authority with soldiers under me. So he said, I'm not the highest one, in the, in the, uh, but I'm not on the bottom rank either. Okay, he said, now I tell, I tell this man, tell this one to go, and he goes, and that one come, and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does this. So he under, he's beginning to understand the, uh, the human chain of the rank. Because that's what he, he, that's what he does. And you, you, you and I know that as well, because see, when we worked on our jobs, uh, we went in and, and we wasn't on, over nobody. Everybody was over us, because we just got there. But as you stayed there for a while, you got a little rank, you got a little authority, and you begin to kind of move up the chain. And, you, and so you can understand how authority goes 
uh, in the human chain, but now he's understanding who Jesus really is. Because see, he's been hearing about Jesus, doing all, performing all these miracles. He's hearing about Jesus, casting out all these demons, and he understands a mere man can't do this. I mean, a mere man can't, can't, can't tell the, will, the wind and the waves to shut up and they cease. Just like I was telling you last week, when Jesus didn't have, he didn't go through a long 10 minute prayer when he walked in the room, he just told the demon to shut up and then get out. Simple. You don't have to go through all of that when you have faith in what you say. All right. All right. He said, I said to my servant to do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. Why was he amazed? First of all, because he was a Roman soldier, and they wasn't supposed to have this kind of faith in him. Now, now this is the question I have to ask you, the class. I know y'all taking up money, but I want you to hear me. <laughs> Don't let the money distract you. Because I got a very important question to ask you. When did the man get healed? Think about it. You didn't see it in Scripture, did it? But when did he get healed? Forward. <laughs> Okay, all right, there you go, all right, all right, all right. This is, this is right here is when the man got healed. He said, when, when I said to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. That's when the man got healed. Because what was he amazed at? The faith that this man had. How many times in the scripture have you heard Jesus say, your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you whole. He don't have to touch you. Now, see, those guys last week, they had to get the man in the house because that's where their faith was. They felt like, I got to get him in front of Jesus. Or else we ain't going to be made well because, see, they, they meant an extra effort to go up to the top of the house to rip the roof off of this man's house to get this servant down in front of Jesus because that's where they felt like, I got to do that. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Their faith brought him. They didn't have to bring him, but their faith brought him. But this man's faith has gone just a little bit further. His faith is where we have to be right now. Because Jesus in the, in the physical is not coming to see about you. Only the spiritual part is going to come see about you. And see, the spiritual part has no barriers. There's no limit time frame. There's no distance that the Holy Spirit can't move and get to you. He said, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and he turned into the crowd following him. He said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith, even in Israel. The one I come, the ones I come to, don't have this much faith. Well, that's a rough word right there. Now, the world is looking at us. We proclaiming to be Christians. We get all dressed up and come to church on Sunday. But the world is looking at you. How you act Monday. And some of them don't have to wait to Monday. And Jesus is saying, y'all get all dressed up and go to church, and you still ain't got no faith. So as you leave church, you start acting like the world. Where is your faith? I, I want you to let's see yourself in this lesson this morning, because we're all in it. He said, but I'll tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Even among the Christians don't have this kind of faith that this wino on the corner got. Because he knows how to get a prayer through. Yeah, he's down and out. The world will beat him up, but he's still mine. Every now and then, Christians, we get knocked down. Sometimes all the way to the ground. Don't ever think that fella on the corner don't know Jesus. Don't take for granted now because God knows him. What he wants to know is what you're going to do about him sitting, on that, sitting there on that corner. You're going to keep passing him by or are you going to stop and see what he needs? Now he said in his word, now if you've got the substance to take care of this brother and you don't do it, then you're not in a right relationship with him. So we have to be mindful that's why it's good to get up in the morning and pray an earnest prayer to the Lord because he got your direction for the day. Just like when you go to, the, when you go to your jobs, 
even though you knew what to do, there was a direction for you. It just might be a little curve in there today that you're not going to do what you did yesterday. But you have to get directions from your supervisor every day you show up to what you're going to do on the job today. And see, God is our ultimate supervisor. Jesus is our royal priest. And we got to get some directions for today. And I, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a preacher, but I understand preaching. And our pastor's sitting here, and he can raise his hand on this one. He may have a sermon ready to preach on Sunday morning, but God can change his mind. Now, you've studied all week for this. And when you get ready to get up there, God said, no, I don't want you to preach that one. I want you to preach this one. Because I study all week, so I can understand a little bit how this thing works. And I can get up here on Sunday morning, and God changed the whole dynamics of it and send me in the direction he want me to go in because he had that kind of power and authority. Plus, to what I've been studying might not be what you need. And sometimes it may not be but one person that this message is supposed to hit. And if I was going to teach what I was going to teach, it wouldn't hit you. But if I say what God told me to say, then you're all in it. All right, let's look at the rest of it. He said, when, you, when he heard this, he was amazed. He said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been, had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. That's why I was asking you that question, when did he get healed? It's kind of amazing, isn't it? You got to really look at this thing to understand what, his, what he has done. When they got back, he was already well because Jesus didn't have to do anything. The centurion's faith and what Jesus could do Heal this man. As church members, we have to always be in prayer for one another. And that's where the power source is. See, the work is not here. We come to church to do what? First to worship. And to praise him. And to learn about him. Like you pull into the filling station and fill up your tank. You don't pull, it, pull up in the filling station to put your credit card in there and then pull it out and leave. You get your gas, don't you? So what, well, you come into church and you're not going to get no power today? You're not going to learn anything that you didn't know before you got here? Some little nugget ought to be able to drop that you could pick it up. And I tell you often, a little, just a little nugget would change your whole dynamics of your life if you're paying attention. Now, you have to be careful because, see, the devil has come right in here with you. And just when the pastor's going to say something that's going to rock your world, he made the baby cry. Or that person you sit beside, reach over there, peck you on and want to start a conversation. And you're sitting up there being kind, trying to listen to the conversation, tell us, instead of telling them, would you be quiet for just a minute? See, boy, I just told you, Jesus told us, shut up. You might not want to say shut up, but I'm trying to get this. Just give, give me a minute. Give me a minute. Hold your conversation for a minute. I'm trying to get this. The pastor talking to me. You finally coming down my row. I need to get this. So you have to know, you have to be able to understand how the devil works. And he'll take a ride on any of us. You know, he might have rolled in on my back this morning. You just don't know. <laughs> so he said, when the men had heard this, they went home and found the man healed. Today, let's get a healing today. Somebody come in this morning, has some issues. You need some healing. It could be in your body. It could be in your mind. There's a lot of mental illness going on today, and, and, and we cover it real well. You know, we even got a mask to put on our face to cover it up now. But then we mask it up anyhow because we just smile as everything is all well. And know we're being torn up on the inside and go home and go right on back to the house. That mental illness we still have when we come to church. See, God can take care of that too if you give it to him. You know, if your children are acting up, he can take care of that too. If your spouse is acting up, he can handle that too. But you got to give it to him. And sometimes the cutting up is not your spouse. It could be you. <laughs> to thine own self be true. All right, let's come in up. My time is just about up. And I... He said, now, this week's scripture focuses on the faith that the Roman centurion displayed in Jesus and his humble petition for Jesus to heal his beloved servant. Such faith and such humility of this Gentile are what Jesus, uh, high, 
commend, highly commended before the Jewish multitude and what the gospel writer teaches us through God's holy word. And as such, we are to call on, on the Lord in like manner. Men ought to always pray. God has said that in his word, and women inclusive. There is not just a morning prayer in and a mouth. There's prayers all day long for whatever situation you're getting ready to enter into. Always call on the name of the Lord so he can help you get through what you're going through. Only he can make it right. And as we come to church this morning, let's didn't get all dressed up just to come to church and said I was in the church this morning. I pray that you got something out of the lesson this morning. You know, it, it, I don't know what, what you got, but I just pray you got some little nugget that will help you out in your daily walk this week. And as we transition over and over into the worship service, I pray that the pastor will also say something that will help you out. He don't know where you is, but God does. But God has given him a word to reach out to each and every one of us. In the word, there's something for all of us. And also in the word, there's some, there, 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 it could be just a zeroed in on you. And no, he's not throwing slams. We got that word. He's he throwing slams up there. No, he's not throwing slams. You need to be hit between the eyes today because you need to rock your world. God is trying to reach out to you and help you out. Let's pray. Father God, in the precious name of Jesus, we come now saying thank you for your word. Your word was like a smorgasbord before us this morning. We pray that we have died to the point that we are now filled. Oh, God, we didn't know who your word touched this morning, but we pray that it touched somebody that it would be a better off now than what it was before the lesson even started. Now, God, we ask that you continue to be with us as we transition into our worship service. Pray, oh, dear Master, that you would let it be what you would have it to be. Just had, let your Holy Spirit come and rule and reign in this worship service. Shekinah, Shekinah glory come down and have your way so that all of us will worship you in spirit and in truth. And we'll all leave better off than what we was when we came. Now we ask you to continue to bless us all as only you can in the precious and sweet name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.